And last week I was in India, and in India you can meet incredible people and incredible entrepreneurs. You can also meet incredible poverty, but I happened last week was a week that I met some incredible entrepreneurs. And one of them um, is building a city called Gift. Gift, like as in gift. Uh, and that city is going to host or be the home for six million people. And he's building it as an entrepreneur. It, he, I don't know if it's dodgy or not, he made a deal, he got a plot of land from one of the states and he's building the city. And he's saying this is going to be the first modern city. It's going to be the most sustainable city in the world, that's step one, but it's also going to be the first modern city that will have a soul. So that's why I thought I'm going to do. My key advisor told me not to play music at Cambridge University, but here you go, that's what you do to advisors. Anyway, um, I need to warn you, I am Dutch, which is not far from here, but there's a channel in between, and it's like, I don't know what's in the water, but the wrong end of the water comes on our shores, I can tell you. So, what does it mean? Dutch people are very low on diplomatic skills. <laughs> they sound like communists to most of you. <laughs> and... and their ability to say things in a somewhat polished way has never really been fed to them. So I apologize if I insult any of you. I apologize for my broken English. I apologize for all that, but I can't help it. And I'm not going to change it either. I'm too old for that change. So you're just going to have to live through it for a whole hour. <laughs> this is going to be your big problem. And I use swear words if I get going, so I, I apologize. For, I don't think that's necessarily Dutch. That's just me, Rod, is it? Anyway, man, here we go. So tonight I'm going to talk about the revolution of capitalism, which is a nice communist way to start any presentation. <laughs> uh, again, my advisor had put the R in between brackets so that you could think it is about the evolution of cap. That's bullshit. <laughs> we're going to go revolution uh, because we're in a hurry. Um, so I'm Peter. I used to be the CEO of TNT which is one of the greatest companies on the planet. Um, and in 2008, I flew out to Seattle. And may, some of you will, many of you will not know, but in Seattle is the head office in the main manufacturing line of Boeing, the aeroplane machine builder company thingy. And uh, we picked up our own Boeing 747. Hey. I mean, are there still people in the room who dream of buying Porsches when you grow up? <laughs> it's not very popular anymore in the sustainability space, I know, but, you know, in, in my life, you know, when, when you started careers as a student, your dream was, I'm going to make a career and then I'm going to buy a Porsche. And I made that career and I did buy a Porsche once, stupid, but I did. And I still remember the moment that I went to the Porsche dealer to pick up my Porsche. You know, I was like, wow. Anyway, imagine that feeling, but then on a slightly bigger scale, picking up your own Boeing 747 in your colors. Hey, if you want to talk toys for the boys, that, that is <laughs> like a big toy for the boy. Anyway, I still have the leather jacket in my house because it's an amazing moment in life. But then I did put the sustainability lens on this same beautiful machine. Because TNT, I've always said, TNT is a great example of a company that is a beneficiary of globalization. Because what is globalization? Globalization is that, I don't know, this bottle of water you can buy anywhere in the world. It is very possible that you're in a meeting in China and Hilden water will be served for some stupid reason. Uh, but the same, you know, every suit, every shirt, anything you can buy in England, you can buy in China, in Brazil, wherever you are. And most of these products are being produced in one or two places, and therefore they have to be shipped all across the world. And that is what machines like this do. So this is a machine which we, we at one point in 2009 had two of these machines in TNT. And these two machines would fly nine rotations per week between uh, Europe and China. In TNT we had our own airport in Liège in Belgium. And we would fly the machine to Shanghai, empty, 
40, 50 percent full, which for a transport guy is empty. And then it would land in Shanghai, we would get the stuff out, and then we would fill it with iPhones and iPads and all the other beautiful stuff that is being produced in China. And on most flights back, the, the capacity would be 99.9% .9 full. So an amazing extension of a supply chain in the form of a beautiful baby that can fly around the world. So TNT was a large company, like 175,000 people, 35,000 trucks and vans. They're, they're very big here in the UK. You, you can't have missed the logo. Um, so 35,000 trucks and vans running across all of Europe trying to deliver these parcels and freight and whatever is in there. Two Boeing 747s doing nine rotations a week together, so each does four and a half trips, emit more CO2 than all 35,000 trucks and vans in the same week. And that's a very interesting perspective of globalization, because globalization is cool, you know, the toys for the boys moment, all that stuff. But the extension of supply chains all across the world is such an amazing phenomena when you look at it from an emissions point of view or therefore energy consumption point of view. And somewhere along that journey, I really woke up to sustainability. In TNT, we did all kinds of things, World Food Program and stuff. I'm not going to talk much about that tonight. And I met the power that business has when the energy of sustainability gets introduced into it. Because I've seen no better instrument in the company to motivate, inspire, or make people proud of the company than the sustainability work we did. No bonus scheme, no nothing could ever create the same amount of excitement. But I've also seen the limitations of where business is stuck in the system. Because three, four times a year as a CEO, you were sent on roadshow to beautiful cities like London. And I can tell you, that's where the bad people live. You think it's Wall Street, but the city in London is worse. Anyway, and then you would be beaten up four, five, six days in a row about minute operational details to do with your EBTA and your cash flow and all these other great concepts. And you could win any price you would want to win in the sustainability space, and in one hour of a conversation, you would not even get a minute of time to talk about it. The, the one quarter when everything was going for us in TNT, I did get twice in, one, in a meeting the opportunity to talk a little bit, and then they said, well, this is not really relevant for your performance, is it? So that's where I see the opportunities in business, and I saw the limitations. So then I turned 50, which is for the first few rows here, is a completely alien concept. And uh, don't even imagine how it is, you know, the only way to con convince yourself you're young is to, to play music when you start talking to people, but for the rest it's all going downhill really, really fast. But for some of the others in the room who've been there, it's one of those moments in life that you think, geez, what is life all about? You know, I'm gaining all these experiences, I'm having all these opportunities, and when you're the CEO you have loads of opportunities and loads of experiences, but what purpose does it serve? And what is happening in the world around me? And am I in the, in the position where I can make a real impact? So I decided that I had enough of running companies. Um, and I got out and I moved into WBCSD, which is the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Try that for your job interview. <laughs> it's an amazing. I don't know who made that name up, but... Uh, that's, it's not high on the list of priorities, but one day. Anyway, like was said, um, it's a group which has been in existence in different forms and shapes and sizes for about 20 years. It's a collection of some of the largest companies in the world, some 200 members. It's a member-based organization, so it's a business membership-based organization exclusively focused on sustainable development. So we don't talk uh, world trade, we don't talk economy, we just focus on sustainable development. 
um, and we do that together with these companies. There are great names on it. There are some dodgy names on it as well. Uh, there will be companies who truly lead the change that the world needs, and there are companies who are just there for the logo. Like in any population, you will see this. And over time, as we start turning up the sound of the music we're playing, we will clean that up and we'll make it a truly progressive voice of business that the world needs. But this, this is what it is. So it's many sectors, many geographies, some of the largest brands in the world who take sustainability serious and have decided a long time ago to come together to create initially, like Polly said, awareness. So our library and our website is filled with documents and some of them are ultra cool, deep thinking. It's, it's good stuff that is being produced. But I, I, when I came in, I said, you know, the world of sustainability has by now written down everything that needs to be written down. And I'm not claiming WBCSD was the author of all of it. But if you look at all the institutes that think about sustainability in the world, most things that the world needs are by now written down. What the world is extremely poor in is how do we implement these great ideas. And that is where the next challenge for WBCSD, but I would argue for society as a whole lies. So next to these members, we have regional networks in now 64 countries. So in almost all corners of the world, you will find local BCSDs, which will have local members, sometimes subsidiaries of large multinationals, but in many cases, national companies. So this, in my mind, is what I call the army of implementing solutions. 64 countries, thousands of member companies spread across the world. If we can get solutions to be implemented in that scale, we might reach an acceleration of change of the world. And so this was the machinery that I'm now playing with. Let me say a few words about my talk. Again, just to warm you up or to put you asleep, whatever you feel more comfortable with, doesn't matter. Um, but also to warn you where the communist part might actually come in and then just, you know, you do with it what you like. So I've, I, I'm sorry it's my own thinking here, so, uh, you know, I'm Dutch and I'm not an academic, so I'm limited in certain skills, but I try, okay? I did my best. Uh, we're here in the engineering department, right? Am I not Dick? Yes, Dick. Good, thanks, Dick. So, in the engineering department, um, you, you guys will think technology will save the world. Otherwise, you wouldn't be an engineer. Right? If you don't think technology can do it, then why the hell are you studying technology? So, there are lots of people who think technology will do it, and therefore, you guys are the, the people who are going to have to get our planet out of trouble. There are other people who say, well, technology may be or may be not helping us or may be working against us, whatever perspective you want to take. But unless we change behavior of business, of government, but also of individuals, you and I and all of us, we're not going to make it. And I've called that the axis of engagement. If you believe that technology will get us out of this trouble, then you're wasting your time here tonight. We're just going to let you guys get on with it, invent the best technology, and we'll hear when you're ready to implement. If you believe that's not the model, we all need to change, then we need to start taking it more personal than we do today. And, and truth and reality is never on one axis, it's probably a bit of everything, but that's one way to position how you mentally think about this type of things. The other axis is about urgency. There are people who say, you know, 20 years ago, business had no idea what sustainability was. 10 years ago, when CSR was invented, it was still a little bit strange if you had a CSR program. Today, there is no serious company anywhere in the world who is not publishing a sustainability report or has a sustainability officer or talks about sustainability somewhere in their strategy. So we're making massive progress. Give it another 10 years and, and business will find a way to solve this. The other people say, well, hang on, we've been going at this for a little while and all the trends are still moving in the wrong direction. So yes, there may be understanding, but we're not very effective. And depending on where you are there, 
you think this is more or less of an urgent issue. If you're in the, what is it for you, bottom left, you think the world is coming to an end, we must mobilize everybody, and this is a massive undertaking. If you're in the top right, you think we're almost home, you know. We made great progress and technology is around the corner, and so it's not as big an issue. And I think this is, you know, probably if you plot, we're not going to do it. We don't have time, but if we would have a technology in this engineering room of yours, where everybody with a laser point could say where they are, you would get a very interesting picture, and that picture would completely determine what you think of what the communist is going to say next. If you're, if you're in the bottom left, you love the communist, and the more revolution, the better. If you're in the top right, you think the guy should not be here. Who invited this man? Kick him out of this room. So I wish the ones who are in the top right a great evening. If you want to leave, there is, I'm not offended. I'm Dutch. I'll, I'll say one or two nasty things on your way out, but that's about the worst that can happen to you. So please feel free to leave now. Um, let me talk about the state of the world. So sustainability is not new uh, by any means. Um, sustainability was probably first made into a big global discussion by the, the Club of Rome in 1970. They published a book called The Limits to Growth. The book has been redone or updated a couple of times uh, since, and every time we update it, the original turned out to be pretty accurate projection of where resource constraints in particular would become troublesome. In 92, uh, so 20 years later, the world under the UN for the first time met in Rio. And that was the first of the Earth Summits. And in that meeting, there was a document agreed between all governments of the world, which was called Agenda 21. And I don't know how many of you have ever done that, but if you download that document today and you read it, you'll be amazed how up-to-date that document is. The, the issues mentioned and identified there are still the issues today. Arguably, the only thing that has changed is the urgency of all these issues has gone up tremendously. Uh, then 10 years later, Joe Burke, and six, seven months ago, June last year, uh, there was um, Rio plus 20. Again, Rio de Janeiro, again, UN, Earth Summit. 55,000 people met for almost a week to talk about sustainability, and after all that talk, they produced a document called The Future We Want. Can I see a raise of hands of who have written it from cover to, uh, read it from cover to cover? That's encouraging. Well, you've made the right choice because you would have wasted your time. It is a complete non-committal document. It's not worth even reading the executive summary. Um, and what is very interesting from Rio, 55,000 people, serious people, government leaders, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, 1,300 business leaders were, were a part of that 55,000, were having their little meeting. 12 kilometers down the road, there was a thing called the People's Forum. Did any of the young people go to the People's Forum? That's disappointing, guys. You should pay attention. Those are cool meetings. So there were. 12 or 18,000, I forgot the number now, but young, mainly young people having their people's forum, having an alternative Earth Summit. They didn't publish anything, but they were certainly energized to change the world. So the conclusion is, we're taking this serious at the global level. You know, there's, I don't know how many, but more than hundreds of thousands of people spending their days full time thinking about sustainability. There's, there's lots of people, and some of them meet in these meetings. So what happened in the last 40 years since we put all this energy into it? Well, to be honest, uh, not much. We live in a world where every six seconds a child dies from hunger. So now another child has died. And now again, every six seconds a child dies. 18, 
thousand children die each day from hunger. And there's enough food in the world to prevent that. So if we're so fucking serious about sustainability, why can't we even keep these kids alive? And every 12 seconds a child dies from lack of sanitation or clean drinking water. Every three seconds a girl under 15 is forced into a marriage. It's real progress. So anyway, that part of the agenda hasn't really worked. The damage to nature is unmeasurable. There's no slide on it yet, but carbon emissions is a cool one. Carbon emissions are going up and up and up, and we know they need to come down and down and down, but they continue to go up. Um, you are all in the engineering department. You like building stuff. 1,300 coal-fired power plants are being built at this moment in the world. Did you hear me? 1,300 coal-fired power plants are being built in the world as we speak. None have CCS, carbon capture storage, which is 40% of the installed base of coal-fired power plants is being added as we speak about sustainability. We're not on any trajectory to make less CO2 into the atmosphere, we're only accelerating. Um, so in the world, what happens? All the governments of the world meet and they talk about climate change agreements, Kyoto and, and successors to Kyoto. And the whole purpose of that whole circus is to limit the warming of the planet to two degrees. That's the officially stated just about acceptable warming this planet may have. Nobody knows why that would be acceptable, but we've agreed that that could well just be acceptable. The IEA has published a report last year, November 2011, uh, saying two degrees is not obtainable. We're looking at four, five, maybe even six degrees. World Bank has published just before Doha, I think November, December last year. Um, two degrees is not obtainable. Four degrees is the minimum. So we're looking at a world that is going to get seriously warmer and we're still not slowing down the emissions. And of course, one of our big challenges is the continuous rise of population. I, I won't bore you with all these stupid facts that how many people were on the planet when I was born. It will only show how old I am, but we're at 7 billion people today. We're going to go to 9 plus billion, maybe 10 billion people by the time it's 2050 which is one thing. So we're going to have to feed another 3 billion people. Most of that growth is happening in areas which today we would call the developing world. So when poverty eradication is already a stress item, it will only become a bigger stress item because that's where the growth is going to happen mostly. England, Europe, America doesn't see much population growth. Other places will. Um, the second concept underlying the population trends is that today in the world we have two billion middle-class consumers. Probably most of us in this room qualify for that bracket. Those are the people who buy cars, who buy refrigerators, coffee machines, and all the other stuff that we like to collect in our lives. In this period, to 2050, the two billion will become five billion middle-class consumers. That's great for business. You know, I happen to sell coffee machines. I'm going to sell twice as many, maybe more, coffee machines. But that's where the resource constraints will really come and bite us. So you guys probably have heard of the footprint that we currently use in the world. Humanity today uses 1.4 planets each year, already today. If we go to from, not from 7 to 9 billion, if we go from 2 to 5 billion middle-class consumers, <coughs> <coughs> we are going to use between three and four planets. Um, I once met a guy in China, an older gentleman, who thought I was completely crazy talking about these things. He said, well, we will, f we will invent a rocket that will bring us to another planet. Mm. I had not read the manual for that statement yet. Uh, and maybe there are more planets, I don't think so. So we have to do with this planet. And I think about this planet, which is the first communist statement of the night. I think of this planet as a spaceship, which is not an inappropriate name for it actually, because 
I don't know if you ever slept under the stars in an area which is not polluted by light and you wake up a few times during the night and you see how this whole spaceship is circling through a much bigger space with lots of other lightning balls up there. This is what it is. So we are all astronauts on our spaceship and we're not taking the best of cares of the ship. And the ship is all we have. So when WBCSD a few years ago wrote a book called Vision 2050, it basically predicted that the first 10 years after that book was published would be the turbulent teens. So let me take you through that. This is the first thing actually that I did when I joined WBCSD a bit more than a year ago. I said, okay, that's great writing books about turbulent teens, but how turbulent are they? So I took pictures of the last 12 months from around the world. Well, firstly, the economy is in deep trouble. Started in 2008 with the financial crisis, rolled smoothly on into the euro crisis, and is now spreading and infecting the whole world economy. Um, it doesn't matter which statistic you look at, but the amount of bankruptcies in most societies are higher than ever and continue to rise. Unemployment factory closings are back into the news, you know, people protesting against it. But also more mundane issues like the commodity food prices are rising again, which for you and I is an irritating 10 cents more for a box of rice in the supermarket. But if you have a dollar a day to live off, it's, it's the difference between a meal or no meal. So the economy is clearly under a lot of stress. If that was all, there is the weather that we need to deal with. And it doesn't matter where you look, you know, the monsoon in India, which is not producing the rain it did. Uh, rain in parts of Africa has moved four to 500 kilometers north. So basically the areas where there was agriculture, there's now no more water, and the areas where there is no agriculture is where the rain is falling. So patterns are shifting. Of course, Sandy is a great example. Sad for the people who are from New York or who lost relatives or possessions, but it's a good wake-up call for the Western world that this will be coming ashore. The saddest story of all stories this year is about Greenland. <clears throat> and, and you need to tell me if I'm just repeating the lectures you guys get every day. But I'm going to give you a one-liner anyway. So Greenland, this year, for the first time, is defrosting for 100%. So it has never happened before. Greenland, we, we saw Greenland melt on the edges for the last few years already. <clears throat> but this year, in the summer, for the first time, the whole surface of Greenland was in a melting process. I'm not saying all the ice of Greenland has melted, because then we would not have been sitting here. We would have been higher up in the building. And we would come to the university by boat. But, but for the first time, all of the surface was in a melting process. Some of you are familiar with ice, others not. If ice is frozen, it's white. If it starts to defrost, it turns to light gray, to dark gray, and the next thing you know is you see a puddle of water. That's the process, and for the engineers, that's called the albedo effect of ice, which is, you, don't, you can forget all this noise, it's just to fill the time. Anyway, when ice is white, and the sun beams its energy on it, it bounces back, just like a mirror. On, on the Arctic, on Greenland, 83, 84% of the sun's energy gets bounced back into the universe. When it goes light gray, dark gray, or water, it starts absorbing energy. Uh, in, the, in the state of Greenland this summer, it was only bouncing back 57%. So there was about 30% spread between not bouncing and absorbing. What does this, this mean? Greenland, this summer, listen up, not Greenland 10 years from now in a maybe correct scientific model, no. Greenland, this summer, has absorbed more energy than the USA consumes in two years. So, did you hear me? twice as much energy than the USA, all of the USA, cars, buildings, factories, whatever they're doing, twice as much 
than the USA consumes in one year has been absorbed by Greenland by the albedo effect of the change of color of ice. And so now you begin to see that the world is beginning to work against us. And this is what scientists, planetary scientists, will call tipping points. And then all of a sudden you get an acceleration in processes of defrost and, and all the other stuff. This is scary stuff. So the economy is in the dumps. The weather is clearly beginning to play tricks on us. And some of the things might be indicators of tipping points. And if that was not enough, let's look at the way we treat each other in society. And there is almost no place in the world anymore where you cannot or where you can see, cannot see, whatever proper English is, social tensions on the rise anywhere. Um, whether it's the Arab Spring, whether it's the massive protests against youth unemployment in Spain, whether it's uh, the, uh, the 100,000 Japanese people. Japanese people do not protest, but there were 100,000 people protesting against energy policy and nuclear energy. Whether it's the EU, whether it's Occupy, whether it's South African mining, whether it's Indian rape cases, everywhere you see the social tension rising. So we have what I call an incredibly toxic mix of economic, social, and climate or planetary stress points working into one big pot of crises. And I am not intelligent enough to explain you the interdependencies, but I do know, I do know as in intuition, intuition can make you know things, whatever, that there are lots of interdependencies. And so we go to all these meetings in Rio, and in Doha, and in Hyderabad, and wherever the next ones are, and governments at this point in time are not capable of coming to solutions. Think about it in this way. We've created a world where we clearly are dealing with a global emergency. And, and you know, forget the social, forget the economic, just take CO2 for a second. You know, CO2, the atmosphere does not care whether it's a Dutch car, an English car, a Chinese car, or some other car emitting CO2. It just goes up in the atmosphere, it gets added to the stock of CO2, and that is causing the eating of this planet. Um, and this global emergency, we are dealing with a system, a governmental system, where 193 countries have to agree every word before we have an agreement. And that's, at the moment, just not working. So the UN process is dysfunctional. Most national governments are focused on short-term pension, house markets, economic type of issues. So they're dysfunctional. The only level of government that is somewhat working at the moment is city level. And, and I'll come back to that a bit later. So if that's the case, then where do we turn for solutions? And of course, I would not be with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development if this would not be my answer. The only force in the world that is powerful enough to make a change at a scale that we need is business. And here is where the people who were kind of disengaged with the communists are getting a bit confused in the story, because how can a communist be preaching in for business, this is like a weird man. Anyway, business will have to take the lead in saving the world, which is not the same as saying business will save the world on its own. It can't be done. Um, if there is one word that we all need to remember from this story is that it's gonna have to be collaboration. It's gonna be academic, it's gonna be governments, it's gonna be NGOs, it's gonna be consumers, and it's gonna be business. But business has the power the technology, the innovation, the management skills, the finance to take the lead. And that is what business should be driven to do. And that is what the World Business Council is set up to try and get done. So this World Business Council has written this Vision 2050. I sometimes say this is the definition of sustainability. So, you know, if you were to do a poll in this room and you would ask people what is sustainability, I would get uh, whatever amount of people are here, but 50 different answers for sure. This is our answer. Sustainability is all about nine plus billion people living on the planet, 
they must all live well, so education, healthcare, food, whatever, at affordable rates, and together we must get back inside the boundaries of the planet. So we cannot continue to think we have three planets, we need to live on one. That's the definition of what sustainability is all about. To get to this vision, we have argued in this document, Vision 2010, that we need to go for a radical transformation. Um, let me be extremely clear to all of you. You cannot save the world uh, through incrementalism. There's lots of incremental things we can and should do to make the world tick a little bit better, but we're not going to save it. We need radical transformations. Let me give you another specific. You cannot save the world based on business cases. There are lots of business cases that are flying, particularly around fuel energy or, or, or energy efficiency or resource efficiency. Lots of things, what we call low-hanging fruit, that business and government should do today and make sense and save money. But there are not enough business cases to save the world. So we have a systemic problem, is going to be the argument. And to break through the systemic problem, we need to get to a radical transformation where things are different, whether it's zero net energy buildings, low carbon mobility, you know, you, you take anyone, zero waste, uh, circular economy, all these concepts at the same time need to be implemented in the next few decades. This is not about incrementalism. Because in all these 40 years that the world has been focusing on sustainability, in all the 20 years that WBCSD has been playing around sustainability, there's one remarkable conclusion. Every one of the planetary boundaries is trending in the wrong direction. Nothing is trending in the right direction. There is one planetary boundary success, which has, I think must have been 15 or 20 years ago, is the ozone layer. That's the only one we've been able to successfully change the course and the trend. All the other trends are going in the wrong direction. So what are we at WBCSD going to do? And where do I think you guys, with all your brain power and your incredible institute here in Cambridge, uh, ought to become helpful? I do not care about 2050. I'll be long gone and dead, certainly not playing music, at least not in this world. So I'll be gone, and it uh, applies for lots of people in the back of the room as well. It's sad. <laughs> maybe, maybe they'll invent pills and keep us around, but that won't be really sustainable. So I'll probably refuse to use them by that time. Anyway, what I do care about is 2020. Because 2020, you know, I might still be in this job. I might still be vital. Who knows what happens? But many people who are currently in boards of companies can be interested for 2020. It's not next quarter's budgets or results, but it is within reach of making it part of a legacy of a leader. You know, that's what leaders think about legacies. So what can we do between now and 2020 that's gonna get us on this trajectory of the radical transformation that we need? And we've called that the must-haves. And so in this book, The Vision 2050, you can't read it, and I don't want you to read it, because most of the stuff on there is cool on T-shirts, but you can't do much else with it. So there's 56 must-haves, things the world must have done by 2020 in order to get to a trajectory of reaching a sustainable world in 2050. We need priority setting in this, so that's what we're going to bring. And for that, we're beginning to link up to scientists. The best model we've found so far on the planetary side, on the environmental side, is the thing called the planetary boundary framework. I think it's being taught here as well, so you, you may have heard of it or you may have even studied it. For those of you who didn't, it is basically a collection of all the climate and environmental models and scientific knowledge in the world put together into a dashboard, I call this a dashboard, that kind of shows how is the planetary stress in, in our system doing. So you see nine elements, climate change, ocean acidification, global fresh water, whatever it may be. And you see red bars coming out. That's where 
the stress in the planetary system is highest, where we are breaching the boundaries that scientists think are safe for us to reach. So it's clear the world always talks about climate change as being the biggest problem we have. And it's true, it's three bars up and it's a pretty hot issue. But if you look at biodiversity loss, so extinction of species, uh, soil degradation, those type of things, that's by far the most serious problem we have. Secondly, nitrogen cycles, mainly to do with, with fertilizers, groundwater pollution, that type of stuff. It's the second biggest problem. Climate change, the third. Fresh water, people always talk about water as well. Water is an urgent issue, but it's different from all the other issues because it's a regional issue. It's not a global issue. I mean, England probably has had too much water in recent years. Switzerland, where I live, never will have a water problem. But if you're in China, if you're in Shanghai, or if you're in northern India, water is already very, very scarce, and water has to be transported over ever longer distances to the people. So this is a framework for the planetary side. I wish I could show you a similar cool picture for the social boundaries, but it doesn't exist. You know, it's remarkable that, I think it was November, October last year, a, a typical capitalist magazine called The Economist, based in uh, this beautiful city of London, just around the corner, said that inequality has overshot its purpose. Their argument was inequality in a society is not necessarily bad, you know, it gives people dreams and aspirations and that moves the whole thing forward. But if the difference becomes too big, then it starts to become counterproductive. And their argument is we have now reached that point. Within countries, the inequality of income has become way too big, but also across the world, the inequality has grown to be counterproductive. And social issues are not only around inequality or about poverty eradication. Um, if you talk to a business person, which I get to do a lot, is uh, eight and a half weeks ago, 151 girls in Bangladesh lost their life in a sweatshop with, which went on fire. When it was investigated, uh, shirts, what's called sweaters, I don't know how you call that stuff, pullovers, were being produced for a company called CNA. I don't know, CNA, are they still here in England? They used to be, but maybe they withdrew. But they're a big retail chain, Germany, France, other places, where they sell beautiful clothes. And they're remarkable, they're a family-owned company. The, the management is really into sustainability. But when I said sustainability is managing your value chain all the way down to the sweatshop in Bangladesh, they had to swallow a bit. And after the incident, of course, they agreed. But before that, they had not paid the attention. And that is what we need to also start doing. There's one other topic to which I've, I've come as far as making a beautiful PowerPoint slide out of it. Well, the reality is I actually built them in Keynote on iPad. But uh, the university does not cater for that yet. So we turned them into power anyway. So all I have said so far is complete bullshit unless we fix this. And, and the same, by the way, applies to India and Indonesia and, and Brazil and those countries. Because we can do all the technological efforts we want to get uh, England to be a green country or Europe or America, whatever we, we're going to cook up. But if the Chinese people are going to adopt the American dream, or if the Indian people are going to adopt the American dream, there is not going to be enough resource or not enough uh, space in the atmosphere for the emissions that that will cause. This is a crucial item that needs to get on the agenda. And it's a very, very difficult agenda item. Because you don't want to tell the Chinese or the Indian or any of the other people, you cannot have a car. And uh, we've polluted the planet, sorry, you go on a bicycle. That's not going to be the winning message. But what is going to be the winning message is an interesting one. Technology will help here. India is a great example. In India, you will not find, almost not find, any fixed line telephones because they jumped straight to mobile telephony. Can we get them to jump straight into the next generation of energy or mobility or buildings? That's 
That's a crucial question that the world needs to answer. Anyway, we will throw all of this in the mix, use science to drive priorities, refocus Vision 2050, and by October, November this year, we hope to publish what is going to be the global business agenda for action in sustainable um, development. And behind that is going to become a measurement system. So we're going to measure whether the world is actually now getting serious about implementing because we need action. And, you know, there's, maybe there's people from business who already take sustainability very serious. Maybe you have heard of, of showcases or pilot projects. All the CSR projects in the world today are not enough to get the trends in science to move in a better direction. Um, so we, we need to think only about one thing, and that is how do we scale all of this up? Because we know there is technology, there's lots of technology, there's lots of ideas, but we can't get them to scale yet. So let me talk a little bit about that. Um, and, and for the students, this is an important phenomena to understand because whatever company you're going to work for, just ask yourself where on this journey is this company and do I want to be part of that part of the journey or do I want to be on another strand? For the people who may be in business, just think about where you're, you are going to take your company. So I always say the, the lowest level of sustainability thinking is denial. You know, it's all bullshit, there is no climate change, it's solar power, nothing to do with human interventions. Business is just here to make money, to create shareholder value. That's the lowest level of, and you'll be surprised how many believe that. Then the first step in the journey is, well, okay, business shouldn't do harm and we should be a little bit thinking about integrity. And so then you talk about principle-based business, ethical-based business even. And you go to the global compact and you see 10 principles of what we think is good behavior. The second step is once you've made that step, you say, well, we should really give back. You know, we make so much money, we should give, give back. So you go and partner with the World Food Program, like I did in TNT, or you go take care of the community around you, whatever it is, but you connect the business somehow to some kind of a good cause. That's great. Every business should do some of it but I guess we will agree it's not going to save the world. The third bit, and this is, this is getting closer to home, we need to start thinking about it in terms of risk management. We need to, today, I mean, if, are there any accountants in the room? I just won. Cool. So anyway, inside governance of business, there's a paragraph which is called risk management, in which the board of a company has to disclose how likely is it that business will survive? What are the risks? And all of these risks are uh, in words of financial risks. There are no risks related to sustainability yet. We need to change that. Sustainability, whether it's weather events or any other risks, are, are going to infect the ability of business to go on. The fourth step is we need to integrate sustainability in our strategy, in everything we do. The best example in the world today is IKEA, the furniture company. You may have heard of them. They published their sustainability strategy uh, eight weeks ago, nine weeks ago. It's called People Planet Positive. They're not a member of WBCSD, so I'm not promoting my own members here. People Planet Positive. Uh, you can download it on the web, People Planet Positive PDF, and it comes in. Um, three objectives for 2020. Number one, IKEA will be energy independent by 2020. Meaning, IKEA will produce more renewable energy than it consumes in all of its operations. This is a great word, it's an extreme variation of saying, I will green my operations, I'll be one of the good guys. The difference with IKEA is last week they have issued a press release, they will invest $4 billion in solar panels on all the roofs, on all the stores, worldwide. So they're serious. Number two objective, we will make the lives of all people in the value chain of IKEA better. 
So not just 100,000 employees of, of IKEA, but everybody all the way back to the people who make their raw materials, they will make their lives better by 2020. Third objective, we will inspire and facilitate millions of people to make their homes sustainable. And this, this is new boundary, you know. My leaders so far talked about we're going to make our business sustainable or we're going to reduce our energy footprint or whatever. But these guys are energy will be neutral, value chain will be life better, and all our customers will get to a sustainable house through us. So what are ways to scale up? This, this is interesting to study and to think about where you want to spend your lives if you want to have impact. Because you know, I would hope that all the students here in the room only think about one thing, and that is, where the hell am I going to have impact? You know, you, you're not studying this for a job or for an income, I hope. You need income, you need a job, I know. But you need to have impact more than anything. These are the mechanisms for scale up. So individual companies can race through this journey that I just showed, from principles to philanthropy to integration. Um, within sectors, we can collaborate. There's great examples. Uh, Cambridge is, is involved in a few. WBCSD does a lot of work with cement companies, forest companies. We bring one sector together and slowly but certainly we raise the bar of being more sustainable. We can work cross sectors, value chains. So Puma is a great example. They have looked first at the pollution in their factory, then they went down their value chains, they found at least 30% more optimization. And lastly, um, we need to change the rules of the game. That's what I said earlier. There are not enough business cases to save the world. So let's go there. Um, I have to admit, you probably saw by the funny dress, I am a capitalist. I, I told you I was a communist, but not really. Um, I, <laughs> the funniest thing I did in my first year in this job, I was in Jeju Island. Nobody knows where it is, but it's south of South Korea. There was the World Conservation Congress. Seven and a half thousand conservationists were there. Most of us would call them hippies. I know there's some people with long beards, and I don't want to offend you, but I'm Dutch, so I told you. But I would call them hippies anyway. So there were, and, and then there was this, uh, the first opening day, I was the first business person ever to talk to the World Conservation Congress. So, you, you know, you're a Dutch guy, three and a half thousand people in the room, a bit nervous. So I walk up and I say, good morning. I am a capitalist. <laughs> Jeez, was I happy they did not hand out tomatoes when these people came in. But let me explain to you, because not everybody knows what a capitalist is. What is capitalism? Capital, a capitalist, is somebody who puts capital to work and he wants something back. It's, he has capital, puts it to work, wants something back. So that's why a capitalist says there's a return on capital employed. That's capital to work, wanting something back. That's great. That's capitalism. The mistake we made in capitalism is that all we do is we measure and we manage and we optimize the return on financial capital. That's all we do. We do not care about anything else but return on financial capital. Roki, it's called. And that's a big mistake. But that's how every business school in the world trains its students, shareholder value thinking, return on capital thinking, it's always around financial capital. And what we should do is think more carefully, because we use nature, and that's a capital, and we use people in value chains, and that is capital, social capital. So the world we're going to move to is a world where we will change the rules of the game where a capitalist will not manage just financial capital, but will also manage natural, manage natural and social capital, and optimizes the returns across the three. That's what I call a revolution of capitalism, 
or if revolution bothers you, because it identif is identified with bricks and firebombs, evolution, I'm happy too. But it's going to be a revolution. You know, you know what the beauty is about English not being your own language? If words get a little bit difficult, you need to use a dictionary to find out what the hell these words mean. I have it all the time, you know. It's, these days they're on the iPhone, so it's easy. But if you look in the dictionary, what is revolution? It is a radical transformation in a limited amount of time. Sounds pretty accurate to me. That's where we're going to go. So, what is changing the rules in the game? There's lots of experiments going on. Some in competing schools. Uh, Harvard, Michael Porter is doing work on shared value. You may have heard of it. If you haven't heard, it makes for really interesting reading. January 2011, Harvard Business Review was a good article to, to start. Conceptually very cool. Measurement-wise, impossible and an empty shirt. So I wouldn't spend too much time on it because it's not going to fly. Puma is by far the groundbreaking company in this space. Well, in English you say Puma, but it sounds like puking to me, so I always say Puma the way the Germans say it. Puma, ja wohl. Anyway, so Puma has done an EP&L, a profit and loss statement. Puma makes 320 million euros of EBITDA, of profit, and they've taken a 145 million euro charge for land use, water use, CO2 use, pollution and waste, uh, five buckets. It's incredibly detailed. They have therefore had to price nature, which for many conservationists is a holy grail. You do not get to price nature, but they've done it. And they've done it very effectively. Because what they came to conclude is this 145 million euro of charts, almost half of it was the result of leather in the shoes. So to make leather you need a cow, the cow needs to be on a piece of land, drinks water, produces methane and all that other stuff. And that was all captured. And now they have decided that within three years they will try to replace leather from their shoes by something that is way less impactful on nature. And this is a very, very interesting example of where business plays the game that they always play, i.e. minimizing the cost, maximizing the profits, but now focused on the cost in nature. They also are now working on a thing called the SPNL, the social PNL, but just as I did not show you a framework, it will take them longer, but they're getting there. Then there is, came out of the accounting for sustainability Prince of Wales initiative, now a global movement called IIRC, Integrated Reporting, International Integrated Reporting Council. Um, IIRC.org, is it, Rod? I think that's the website. You can download this particular piece of document. Gives you a very good feel. It is a beginning of a revolution. It's not yet there yet. Where the Def, where, where this all will go is this particular slide. And you know, since there's only one accountant in the room, this, this won't look like much of a revolution to you. Um, but I can tell you, show this to a room of accountants and the place will be shaking. And not necessarily with a pos positive vibration. So on the left, you see what accounting does today. It tells you the story about business, it gives you a risk management framework, and then there's all kind of rules on how you actually do the financial accounts. I mean, I don't know if you've ever studied accounting. Um, you should if you want to be in business because it's the language of business. But whatever you think of that, you will never ever be in a business meeting having a debate about how people calculated their profit. Never. You will never ever challenge that if ABITDA is 100, that, that's on never. There's rules. People just do the rules and come to a number and that's the number. And then you talk about the number is not good enough, but you do not talk about the number as such. When a company today publishes its CO2 number in a sustainability report, you or I or none of us have any idea how that was calculated what the scope of it was. 
your report, your report, your report, your report, there's no way of comparing the numbers because there's no rule on how these people calculated their reports. And if we want to measure progress, we need to get comparability. We need to start saying, hey, this guy is doing a much better job than that woman. What is this woman going to do to improve? And then we get to focus in the rules of business, but redefined. And that's where we are going to go. The last step, and that's by no means the smallest step, is we need to get the capital markets to play as well. Because the best CEO on this island is a guy called Paul Pullman, runs Unilever. Pretty brilliant sustainability strategy, by many in the world seen as one of the most forward-thinking business leaders out there. Member of the high-level panel for sustainable development goals, doing an incredible amount of work. That person will still lose his job if he has one bad financial quarter. We can all agree he's the best sustainability CEO in the world. He will still fly out if he does not perform financially. So we need to get the capital markets to understand this. And that means we need to work with everybody, collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. And you will have to remember only one thing from this talk tonight, and that is what are you going to do to scale up? Thank you very much. Thank <clears throat> you.